Eleven. Salt, light, and law. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew five thirteen to 20 Despite its professed cynicism, the world has a fondness for sweetness and light. It seeks to avoid problems, responsibilities and conflicts. Its concept of light is such a trouble-free life. Our Lord gives no place to such thinking. He never tells us, ye are the sugar or sweetness of the world. On the contrary, we are called to be the salt of the earth. Some modern churchmen, to avoid the force of this word, try to tell you that the purpose of salt is flavour. Salt is indeed primarily used for flavouring by contemporary man, but its basic use in antiquity and until the present has been as a principal agent of preserving foods. Some, like myself, can recall the rural years before electricity. Meats were kept for summer use in a large crock. Fish, for example, were cleaned and packed inside and out with rock salt and then covered with water. Beef and venison were cut into small chunks or thin sheets and similarly packed in brine. When the crock was emptied of meat or cheese, the remaining brine was emptied onto the pathway or dirt road to be trodden under foot of men. The meaning of salts here is thus preservation. A sinful and corrupt world will rapidly decay and collapse unless the Christian element therein acts as the agent of preservation. Apart from them, society and the state are readily and quickly corrupt. Only the Christians can prevent the radical deterioration of society and civil government. If they fail to work as a preserving agent, the Lord decrees that they shall be trodden under foot of men. Christians must either preserve their society from destruction or become themselves a particular target of destruction. Christians, however, are more than a preserving agent. They are the light of the world. Proverbs 4.18 tells us that, quote, The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, whereas, quote, The way of the wicked is as darkness, they know not at what they stumble. Proverbs 4.19 But there is more. Our Lord declares himself to be the light of the world. John 8.12.12.35 as members of his body, we share in that light. The light we receive, we are to shine before men. Light must not be hid. This would be a violation of the meaning of light. Quote, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. End quote. The reference is clearly to Jerusalem and also to any other city set on a hill. It is highly visible and the lights of that city, even its lamps and candles reveal its presence clearly. Christ's congregation is to be a city set on a hill. The church is called to be salt and light, or else, quote, to be trodden under foot of men, end quote. Here is a warning to all antinomians. The same point is made more emphatically and directly in verses 17 to 20. Biblical blessedness is inseparable from the covenant law. Lest anyone assume that Christ has come to destroy the law, he says emphatically, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The law is God's law. 
Christ is God's Son, he does not come to destroy God's righteousness or justice, but to destroy the power of sin and death. To make Christ the destroyer of the law is to do the work of Satan. The word fulfill in Matthew 5.17 is pleroma, plero. This word, when used with reference to time, can mean that the time or era spoken of has come to pass, and in this sense is ended. In other usage, it means to fill and to keep full. To illustrate, Paul uses this word in Philippians 1, 9-11. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. End quote. The word plero is used in verse 11, translated here as filled. Paul calls on the Christians of Philippi to grow in love and knowledge and to be, quote, filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, end quote. It would be nonsense to say that Paul means that, having attained salvation, they are now dead to love, knowledge and righteousness, or law, justice, through Christ. It is equally nonsense to say that Christ declares that he has come not to destroy the law, but to end it and put it aside. Indeed, our Lord goes on to warn against any lessening of the force of the law. This, however, has been no barrier to dispensationalists, beginning with the Jesuits and on through their heir, Schofield. Our Lord goes on to say that not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away, or pass from the law till all be fulfilled, end quote. Now we have another word used for fulfilled, genomai, related to genau, beget. Genomai means to be begotten, to be born. When John 1.18 speaks of Jesus Christ as the only begotten son, the word is monogenes. Our Lord is not talking about the death of the law, but its true beginning in him and in his new humanity, his covenant people. A stronger affirmation of the validity of the law could hardly be made. Our Lord then declares who the evil ones are. First, anyone who would break even the least of the laws of God. And second, and worse, any and all who teach his people or anyone to break these laws, even the least of them, shall be called, quote, least in the kingdom of heaven. Thus, while an antinomian may possibly be saved, he is singled out as the lowest in the category of the redeemed. Our Lord does not say anywhere that this requirement to teach his law ends with his cross. It is a fanciful rewriting of scripture to say so. Paul cannot be cited for justification because he rejects such a thought. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Romans 3.31 when Paul speaks in Romans 8, 4 of the requirements of the law being fulfilled in us who are saved, he uses the word genomai, begotten. Third, those who obey and teach the law, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Clearly, law-keeping is a sign of covenant grace. When James says that faith without works is dead, James 2.26, he is restating what our Lord and St. Paul both say. Finally, our Lord makes clear that none can enter into the kingdom of heaven unless their righteousness, quote, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, end quote. The false righteousness of the Pharisees replaced God's law with man-made laws, with the traditions of men, Matthew 15, 1-9. All such have no place in God's kingdom, whatever their church rank may be. This sentence makes clear that what our Lord means in Matthew 5.19 is not a full-blown antinomianism, but a rejection of one of the least commandments. The teachers and followers who are least in the kingdom of heaven are people who obey most of the law, but set aside some as trifling or relatively unimportant to obey. Any other interpretation does violation to our Lord's words. One final note. The word translated in Matthew 5.17 as destroy means literally to loosen down or dissolve. 
Our Lord did not come to loosen the force of the law, but to create a new humanity which could live faithfully in terms of God's righteousness 